Welcome back to Total Confidence Podcast. Got a very, very special guest today. The founder of the Black Enneagram. Man, um, I discovered you on Instagram. And I saw just the, the beautiful graphic display and just um, just the utility in what you're doing. But we have with us, I got to I got to try to pronounce her name because I got to be a little extra. Then we're going. So it's Adidayo Beijayo Ejanoku. Yes. <laughs> Dayo for short. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> she is a lifelong student focused on bringing joy and justice to the world. She leads with Enneagram Type 1 and is the founder of the Instagram page, The Black Enneagram, where she offers basic Enneagram education through Black culture and Black images. The Black Enneagram combines her love of the Enneagram, Black culture, entertainment, and Christianity with the purpose of increasing self-awareness, growth, relational health, specifically in the Black community. She regularly engages issues of faith, justice, self-awareness, love, and unapologetic joy. I love that. The Black Enneagram is a safe haven for all people, regardless of racial identity, who want to grow in the kind of godly self-love that overflows into love for all. Dio is currently working on her certification with the Narrative Enneagram and is currently a, what year? Yes, I'm a third year now, so I'm almost done. Third year, law yeah. student, <laughs> uh, rising law student at Berkeley Law. Welcome to the Total Confidence Podcast, Dio. Thank you so much. I asked my, asked my hear that red back to me. I'm like, I wrote that so long ago. It's still so true, but I'm like, I feel like I was able to capture a lot of what I was envisioning then. So I'm glad that that still resonates with me. <laughs> Awesome, awesome. Yeah. So your name, mm-hmm. um, as I try to, uh, you know, <laughs> say it, uh, but it's a beautiful name. What does it mean? So I know what my first name means and my last name, but not my, not my middle name. But my first name, okay. Adedato, means um, crown or princess of joy, which is very fitting for the one because we struggle <laughs> with fun and joy. Yeah. Um, and my last name just means like elephant. So, yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Now, um, this year is IEA Global Summit. Yeah. I did get to see you because I wasn't there. I, I think you were just there the first day. I was there the first day on Thursday. Okay. Yeah. I, I think I didn't get in until Friday, so I missed your demonstration. But how was your experience there? It was great. It was nerve wracking because my first time speaking about the Enneagram in person. Um, I'd always done like Zoom, like talks but never in person so that was very scary but it was great because I had Danielle with me Danielle Fanfare and great she's a great mentor like I feel like all the cracks in my like messaging (laughs) she like you know she she filled them in for me and I just felt very like okay I'm giving a holistic like I'm giving a holistic presentation here um so I'm still like very young I'm still like learning the Enneagram so it was really helpful to have someone who's very experienced who's worked with clients like who's done a lot of the stuff for a lot of years um, be with me there but I felt very like this is what I want to do like I feel like I, yeah. I got that sense at the end of it of like this is what brings me the most joy is talking about the Enneagram in a way that centers black people I don't know why but something about that just like it feels something in me um so yeah <laughs> I am in law yeah. school so that's like you know a hard it's very different two different very two very different paths but I feel like there's there's some in- interconnectedness to them so yeah yeah um you you know being in law school what what led you down the path of law um I was gonna I'm and originally it was like my dad pushing me and being like oh like you look into this what would you be interested in this I think as time went on I started to see if like my value system lined up with what it mean and what it means and looked like to be a lawyer and coincidentally yes it does unfortunately a lot of ones aren't attorneys because our legal system in America is not a justice system as you probably know absolutely (laughs) yeah it doesn't really lend itself for to be truly like a one type of um type of career but I feel like that's why I wanted to go into it just to kind of change the narrative change the the perception of what it means to be an attorney especially as a black woman um that's that's really what led me to it just like I have the I think I have the personality traits not being very argumentative but more so like enjoying reading and writing and like advocate advocacy was like the biggest like oh this is definitely my personality like the one 
Wing 2's like um, nickname is The Advocate. So it yes. just felt like yeah. that's the wing I have, I lean on the most. So I was like, oh, like everything is just kind of <laughs> flowing, <laughs> like bring me down this path. So yeah. That's awesome. So where did you grow up? I grew up, so I was born in Nigeria. I'm actually was born there. And I moved here when I was like two years old. And I grew up in Houston, Texas. But I will say my coming of age and when I, like, when I truly felt like summer was home was when I lived in Atlanta, Georgia for undergrad mm. college. That was like, I think because I was surrounded by people who looked like me, like I didn't feel like a dime a dozen like I felt in Houston, even though Houston is very diverse. Like we lived in the suburbs. So we were often sometimes like the only black family on the street. Like it was just not always like the most diverse environment when you live in the suburbs of Houston. Um, but living in Atlanta as a college, student on my own I had no family there I was literally having to like survive without my family with my no friends or nothing um I think that was probably the most positive experience I've had um so yeah so you were born in Nigeria mm -hmm. what differences and I know you say you didn't grow up around a lot of black people but even going into when you went into Atlanta and just being around more black people what are some of the differences that you notice as far as just your upbringing mm -hmm. and maybe the upbringing of some of your peers who were born well, in the States? Yeah. I mean, well, I will say I did grow up around a lot of Nigerians. I think that's a very different, because I grew up, we were cult I'm culturally Nigerian. So my family, like the church we went to, my parents' friends who became my, whose children became my friends. Like I grew up around a lot of Nigerian people. Um, but I think if I was to say the biggest difference with people who live there and were raised in Nigeria versus the Nigerian Americans, it's just like, I think as time has gone on, we've kind of enmeshed a little bit, but I think there's there's typically a level of like respect for elders. That's very different. Mm. Um, I don't think that America has that level of respect for elders the way that Nigerians do. Mm. I think so, and the reason why I know that is because of my when my grandparents or like my aunts and uncles would come and visit from Nigeria, that was something that they would like comment on a lot mm. um, <laughs> that they did not enjoy uh, about us Nigerian American <laughs> children. <laughs> So yeah, I think that that's probably the biggest difference that I can tell. Yeah, yeah, wow, yeah, we don't really esteem the, the elders here like that right. culturally. Yeah. Um, now I was reading your bio. You made the decision to become a Christian mm -hmm. at sixteen. Yeah, yeah, at such a young age to yeah. take a, <laughs> a, a a make a major life decision like that. What yeah. led to, you know, you deciding, you know, for yourself, what you weren't like right, right. pushed into it, but just yeah. conscious choice. Right. It's so funny. I was just talking about this with um, the narrative tradition is doing like a people of color, like co cohort thing. And the topic today was about um, spirituality and the Enneagram. So I just finished talking about this, but I feel like mm. the question directly at the time, I think. To me, Christianity and specifically evangelicalism, I don't, I no longer identify as evangelical. I do still identify as Christian, but mm -hmm. evangelicalism, which is what I was, you know, predominantly following at the time when I was in high school and college, it kind of fit my personality types really well. Like it, it just fit that like the right and wrong, the bad and yeah. good. Like I was able to put things in categories and boxes and be like, hey, this is good, this is bad. It just gave me a very clear sense of how I need to move around in the world which at the time I feel like I need, really needed, you know, to like develop my sense of self. But I feel like as I've gotten older, it's definitely changed. And I feel like I, I don't need those boxes as much as I needed them before. Um, but I made that decision specifically because I think I was going through, I don't know what I was going through. I think I was just going through like a, might've been like a, a little middle school, high school breakup or something like that. <laughs> I needed I needed like a, a so something that made me feel like I was a part of something, like I belonged. Because the yeah. way the, the way the way the I put this on quotes the way the relationship it was a very much not a relationship but the way the relationship yeah. went it was like a friendship relationship like where all our friends were together and so when I let when I lost that relationship I lost a lot of the friends in that and so I lost my sense yeah. of belonging and so I feel like I just wanted to feel a sense of belonging and I remember just like in church hearing like the young people talk about like how their faith gives them a sense of belonging. I think that was kind of what gave me that trajectory of like, okay, how can I do this as a young person? Is there space for me as a young person to like make my faith my own? Um, and it really wasn't my own. I'm realizing I'm unfolding and you know unraveling all this stuff now. At the time, I felt like it was my own, but I think as I'm looking back, I'm like, yeah, I definitely was taking on 
percept well, not in perception, but like ideologies and values that today I would never like follow and believe. So yeah, it's a long winded way of saying like it's evolving and it's changing as time has gone on. But then it was just like, I really want to feel like I'm a part of something bigger than myself. Um, and my, for me, faith was that, was that thing. You, you know, I, I, which was interesting is so many of us who come through religion, mm -hmm. um, I was reading about you and how you isolated yourself. Basically um, we can do that. It's like, okay, this is, you know, I'm I'm the righteous, you know, and um and you talked about that leading to loneliness. Yeah. Like, what was the wake up call for you in that? I would say I think 2020 when I when everyone kind of couldn't go to church, couldn't be physically in church anymore, and I kind of like intentionally was like, okay, with this like hiatus, the sabbatical everyone's taking from church, I'm also going to take a sabbatical hiatus from like reading my reading my word and praying just to see how I feel, to see if I, if, I, if I can still survive. I think the message I was telling myself for a long time was, if you stop doing these things, if you, if you leave this way of being, like, it's over. Like, you're going to hell. It's done. Yeah. And I think yeah. I, like, I, like, took the chance of, let's see what happens if I don't do what I <laughs> do. Let's just yeah. test the waters. And so it's still going on. It's still kind of this, like, journey of, like, I don't, I don't, I'm not ready to, to fully, I don't think I'm ready right now to fully immerse myself back into the practice of Christianity. Like I definitely still go to church, but like the expression of it is very, very different. Um, but yeah, I just feel I don't know. I feel like I 2020 just gave me a lot of room to like sit back and think like, does this really serve the value system that I want to like have in my life long term? Like it's serving me now as a young woman, but like I don't want to be this indoctrinated, you know what I mean? Like feel like a uh, Bible thumper for the rest of my life. Like I don't think it's yeah. this is not sustainable for my mental health and my psyche because it was like your like you said like it was leading to a lot of loneliness loneliness it was leading to a lot of like like low self-esteem it was leading to a lot of like I just couldn't have certain kinds of friends and I felt very like I was like losing friends because of the way that I was having that type one self-righteous you know way of being so it was yeah. just it was just a difficult it just wasn't producing the fruit that I was quote-unquote promised that it would produce it wasn't producing yeah. love patience it wasn't producing <laughs> those things um no especially not gentleness oh my gosh I was just I was just a very rigid person and I think I just was like I don't when I imagine myself as an old woman I don't imagine myself the way that I was in college I imagine myself very like slow and tender and, like gentle yeah. and kind yeah. and I, I can't get there doing what I'm doing right now like there's just no way that I can take that path and get to where I want to go so I have to take a big 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 step back so yeah <laughs> I can relate. Um, sometimes, you know, it's almost like a shield and we just kind of got this armor and we're just going through it and can't really connect with people unless right, they, right. we filter them through our own personal bias. So um, yeah, yeah. I, I can totally relate to that. Now, how were you introduced to the Enneagram? Yeah. So I was during my college years um, in 2019. I remember 2019 specifically but it was like towards the end of it. And I had a friend at church um, who were very close at the time. She was like, honestly, like a friend mentor. And so she was funny enough. I was also going through another relationship issue. <laughs> mm -hmm. And she was like, okay, like there's a lot going on. You're still figuring out yourself. Like, how about she introduced me and I was like, this is a really good tool. Good tool. I think you would be interested in. I think it could help you. Um, so I took the test and I just kind of like ran with it. I love personality systems. I love personality tests. Like, I know my Myers Briggs. Like I, I don't know how how much you um, subscribe to zodiacs, but I know my zodiacs. So yeah, all those things. What's your zodiac sign? I'm a Sag. Sag. Okay. 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 Yeah. My sister is a Sagittarius. <laughs> Sagittarius. So she talks about it a lot. She teaches yeah. me a lot. Oh, yeah. well, I love that. I love that. <laughs> so, so you did it. So it resonated with you immediately. Um, yes. Yes, it definitely resonated with me. I think a lot of times when people hear their type, they feel the this, this sense of resistance. But for me, it just felt like the sense of like a light bulb was coming, was going off of like, yeah. And a low key, low key, this might sound a little crazy, but I feel like I was like, I felt the sense of like, oh, I knew that. Because I feel like ones are very self-reflective and they know all of their flaws and all mm. of them make them bad. So when you read, when you tell me a list of things that I'm doing wrong, I'm like, I already knew that. I've been, mm -hmm. <laughs> I've been scrutinizing myself for the, like my whole life. 
you really mm. can't tell me anything that I don't already know. So that's kind of how I feel about the Enneagram was that, oh, you're confirming that all the things that I thought were bad about me are true. <laughs> 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 um, so like it was organized the same way where it was like, okay, like you fit in this category of people who see the world in this way. That was also something I really loved about the Enneagram was that it, it has a one you think you're right, everyone else is wrong. But the Enneagram opens that up and says, well, there are nine different ways to be right in the world. And that was a very foreign concept to me because mm. I didn't realize, I mean, I know people had different personalities, but like to categorize it in the way the Enneagram does, I'm like, oh, like there are things that I value that other people do not inherently value. They have to, mm -hmm. they have to learn to value. Um, like, in, I mean, everyone values integrity, but not everyone values organization. Like that's, that's yeah. not all those, you know what I mean? It's very different. Um, so when I would have issues with like roommates, cause I do not like having roommates for that very reason. I'd be like, <laughs> oh, she's not a bad person. She just doesn't value organization the way that I do. <laughs> so yeah, lots of learning. <laughs> so when you first heard about the inner critic, and mm. when you first read about the inner critic and the type one, what was your reaction? I'll be honest. I thought the inner critic was God for a long time. And mm. I made them one person or the Holy Spirit. I think that's another, that's another thing. I made them one person. And I think my friend at the time who introduced me to the Enneagram, she kind of helped me understand that like, no, they're not the same thing. Because the inner critic mm. has a different objective and goal than the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit, the way I understood it was like, the Holy Spirit is supposed to be an edifying, encouraging voice. And the inner critic is nothing like that. Like, it's very much like, see, I told you so. As that's the energy of the, of the inner critic. It's like condemning. It's very shameful. It's very like guilt. Uh, guilt. Uh, what is the word? I don't know. It's just, it makes you feel guilty. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I had to, it took me a long time to separate and realize like, oh, if it's coming, if it sounds like it's being filtered, filtered, filtered through this way of being the shame, the guilt, it's probably not the Holy Spirit. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that that was my that was that was the thing that when I first heard about the inner critic, I was critic, I was like, oh, I thought that was God. I thought that was Holy Spirit. I thought that was just the Holy Spirit trying to help me not do the wrong thing. I saw it as like a voice of guidance. Um, and then I was in therapy one time, and I she was she knows about the energy game, and so she was asking me also the same question. And I think. I came up, I realized that also my inner critic sounds a lot like my parents, which is very mm. common. A lot of people, their inner critic will sound like their parents because I, because ones are, you know, you want to be a good child. You want to be a good girl. And so everything that makes up what a good girl is, your inner critic is going to try to make that happen. Um, but in the worst way possible, <laughs> it's not, it's not doing it in a way that's like kind and gentle and graceful. It's doing it in a very aggressive way. And growing up with Nigerian parents who and this is a not common Nigerian experience. So I'm not calling out my parents, but like mm -hmm. there are no Nigerian parents who are very like I don't want, I want to use the word aggressive, but I also want to use the word just like direct. I think the word is direct and very like they're just gonna tell you what's on their mind. They're not really gonna be very tactful about it. Um, and I mean both my parents. I feel like a lot of people experience their moms as very nurturing and soft. No, <laughs> like we yeah, have mm -hmm. both parents are that way. And so growing up like that, it's like of course it makes sense that my inner critic talks the way that it talks because I grew up with very direct you know in a very direct household um so yeah you know I'm, I'm I'm just thinking about the fact that you're like in your early 20s <laughs> and I have a a good friend who's a she's a type type one and I know you mentioned in your bio about like kind of being like an old soul and connecting with yeah. older people and just the level of responsibility, like she in her twenties had a house. Yeah. Uh, we worked together. She'd be on her lunch break, like going over her will and stuff like that. Like I'm like, <laughs> just that level of responsibility. <laughs> and so I'm just, and I'm, I'm, I'm listening to you. I'm like, she's in her early twenties, but it's yeah. really done a lot, you know. Yeah. So, <laughs> so and it's doing a lot. <laughs> So I'm like I'm about to I'm about to enter my birthday is in this month um and I'm entering my I'm leaving my mid-20s and going into my late and so I'm like having this existential crisis a little bit of like I've accomplished like and this is not a to toot, toot my own horn it's just like a reality like I've accomplished a lot so far what else do I want to do um so I'm just I'm just figuring that out and I think that's a common thing with ones is like because when they have a goal they run head fast and they get it done um 
So I can definitely see how another one is has a house in <laughs> funny music. <laughs> so, so responsible. I feel like we just don't we don't deter from the path until it doesn't make sense anymore. So yeah. yeah. Yeah, I admire that, you know, purpose. Yeah. So I, as I mentioned earlier, I first discovered you and your work through the Black Enneagram on Instagram. What led to the creation of the Black Enneagram? And then how was it initially received when you put right. it out there? Yeah, those are a good question. So when I first, saw the, it's kind of twofold. I was in college when I made it. I was in my final year of college. Um, and I was, it's two things. One, I had this personal feeling of like, there are not enough, I, or, or I couldn't see enough black people doing any again work. Like I'm really passionate about it. I love it, but I don't see people who look like me doing the, the work on Instagram, specifically on Instagram, specifically in that medium. Um, I knew people, I, I knew people, I knew somewhere people were doing this work somewhere, but I just couldn't find them. All of the Instagram pages were like white women talking about white things. And I was just, I could not relate to this way of being. Um, and so for, I think for a couple of months, I just like put the interview game down. Cause like, this does not feel relatable as much. Um, cause I think there are two sides of the, and the Enneagram on Instagram. There's like the serious, like coaching, like true wisdom. And there's the silly oh. side. <laughs> there's like the silly, mm-hmm. like, let me type a TV show or let me type, you know, some songs. Like, and I think I, I really enjoyed, I obviously really enjoyed both sides, but I was like, what's missing in the more fun side is a person of color experience of what that would look like for us. Um, so I was taking a class in my senior year um, called Creativity and Innovation in Business. I was a business, business major. And she wanted us to come up with like a novel idea that no one has ever thought of before. And in my naivete, I thought I was <laughs> doing something big. Um, so I decided, okay, I'm going to I'm gonna fill up, fill this gap that I see um, in the Enneagram Instagram market for the on the fun side um, and create this Instagram page. Specifically, the, the, the goal was just to type a bunch of like of my favorite black tv shows um so i was really looking for that that was really what i was looking for um and so i decided to do it myself um i did it for a school project and then i it kind of took off in 2020 um so i was like oh i guess i should just continue doing this after i've gotten my <laughs> my grade and my degree like there's still purpose behind this um and co- like to answer your second question i was really surprised by the response um because majority of the response was like very receptive especially by the white women who were already doing and you can work on the silly fun side. Um, mm-hmm. They wanted to like share my work. That's, I'm so, that's honestly how it grew was that they shared my work. They wanted to mm. collaborate, like all of those things. And I did not expect that. I have growing up in Texas, like especially Houston, like you just don't really know what how white people are going to respond to you. Like you just are, ne- you, you're taking a gamble in Texas. Um, mm. So I, I'm just always prepared for the worst. And so I think I was just pleasantly surprised with the response um, that I got, there were some people that were just like, why do you need a black Enneagram? The Enneagram is universal. Yes, the Enneagram is universal. But if you want to draw in a diverse audience, you have to speak their language. Um, and so I wanted, I just wanted to, to be a bridge. I wanted to be that kind of connector to like black culture and the Enneagram. Uh, I, I really wanted to be an introduction and not like the stopping point. Um, that has never been the goal is to become like the educator. I just really wanted mm. to be like, oh, let's just like, let's have fun with this thing. And then when you feel, when your spirit is led to take this more seriously, let me share some resources of people yeah. who are taking this more seriously. That's not my job. I don't feel like that's my purpose in the Indian space right now um, because I just have so much going on with like law school and just like life in general. It's so, like, I don't want to put myself in that position sharing wrong information. Um, but yeah, it was well-received. Um, it grew pretty quickly. Um, but yeah, I'm obviously, I don't know if this is, obvious blind page i'm taking a huge hiatus since i graduate from law school which would be like by the middle of 2024 so yeah just need to take a breather and focus on getting this degree out of the way too so yeah understandable (laughs) (laughs) you know (laughs) you know yeah i'm just you know in law school getting a law degree i'm like need a break or uh, that's what i was like a a lot within itself and but you have uh touched so many people mm-hmm. and that unique space. And I think I think it's now because we're having a conversation, thanks to the work of Dr. Egerton, Mickey yeah. Scott yeah. Bay Jones, um, which I'm gonna mention her, I'm, we're gonna get into her in a second because yeah. um I just recently interviewed her too. Just I told her I said I could just like I wish I could just like have coffee with you like once That's a week. And just 
and just listen to her talk. I can just listen to her talk like <laughs> for hours. Yeah, um, but just the work uh, Milton Stewart and others oh are doing. Happy get her. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. Um, and but you know now that we're having the conversation, and I think white people don't maybe they know now about the code switching, so they're like, wait a minute, the black people they they're cool, you know. But no, yeah. we're we, we're assuming. We're assimilating, right. but we're leaving out a lot of our ourselves. Sure, you know. And what's interesting, I'm I'm on course with T and E as well. And right. um, you know, when we go into these breakout groups, and it's like black people, and it's just like this. Oh, you yeah. see another black person, it's like this quiet, like yeah. connection, like oh yeah, now I can talk for real now, you know. <laughs> for real, no, yeah. So people I'm... don't maybe not see the nuance that that you're bringing and other yeah. black teachers are bringing. Exactly, exactly. I definitely agree with that. I think when I discovered all these, those names that you, like you mentioned, I was just like, oh, I'm not, I'm not alone. I'm not the only one who sees this from a different perspective. It isn't very, like, isn't very whitewashed. So I felt very, like, seen and, like, just, like, embraced. I think especially Chi-Chi's book, like, I will be honest, I don't, I think I've said this, like, one one other time on our podcast, but Chi-Chi's book is the only Enneagram book that I finished back, like, front to, front, front to back. The other ones I just like skimmed through because I'm just like, oh, this is so difficult <laughs> to read through. <laughs> but she just, yeah. I just was like really drawn. So I was like, oh, you're, you're you're speaking my language. You're speaking to me. Like you're talking yeah. to me directly. And so it was yeah. not difficult to read her book. Like I'm obviously, I've like learned from people directly. I've had exper- experiential learnings. Um, but she, she's book was just like did something else for me um, that I really appreciate her for. So yeah. yeah me as well. Um you know, and Mickey Scott Bay Jones has an article mm-hmm. that called the Enneagram what was an interview turned into an article. The Enneagram is not just for white people. Okay. How did, cause you mentioned how you just kind of like realized you didn't really see the connection. Yeah. Um, you kind of got kind of fizzled out a little bit, just not okay. seeing people that you could relate to right. uh, in our experience but how did your discovery of this article and her yeah. words impact the way you saw this Enneagram space <sighs> I think I felt less crazy because I felt like I a part of me was like why do I care so much that I don't see myself in this um typing system I don't I don't care that I don't see myself in Myers-Briggs like I don't I don't yeah. you know I, I'm not super pressed about that but for some reason seeing like the people of color experience being taken out of the Enneagram experience, it just doesn't feel right. It didn't feel right. And so seeing that Mickey, when she wrote that article, she named it. Like, I feel like I've never heard anyone say it. I've never seen anyone acknowledge it, but she acknowledged it and was very direct about it. Like, this is a yes. problem. Like, why, yes. why is this? Why is yes. it the way that it is? And I think I, I, as a one, she's also a one as well. So I appreciate that. Cause I, I speak in, in those, in those terms, I'm very direct. Like I'm not going to, you know, mince my words. She did not mince her words at all from what I remember yeah. about the article. Yes. And so that, that made me feel like, oh, like, I'm not the only one who feels this way. There are other people who are looking for people of color, like, voices in this thing. Um, she is a, a woman of color, a Black woman voice in this thing. Um, yes. I just felt very inspired by that. And it gave me the courage to be like, at least, at least I know one other person feels this way. Yeah. And I think that was enough for me to hit the ground running and make my page because like if, if just one person follows it great awesome i've accomplished my goal yeah. so yeah 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 it, it's it's i'm i'm very thankful for the work that uh the aforementioned people um have done because i've benefited through scholarships um so i'm grateful um as we come to a close because uh i'm very appreciative of your time as a very busy law student <laughs> i want to be respectful of your time so um if all right so i'm gonna give you a hypothetical thing now okay. i'm 23 year old okay. black man i'm i'm one of your um um i go to your school you know i'm in law school I said hey uh Dio, um i saw your page i want to learn more about the enneagram um what what three books I, I just need three books to okay. get started uh okay. what would you recommend so can i do not just books can i do podcasts as well absolutely okay. absolutely 
So obviously, Chi Chi's book is my first recommendation all the time. It's called The Enneagram for Black Liberation, as you know, but this 23 year old does not know. So <laughs> The Enneagram for Black Liberation um, by Chi Chi is a great book to start with. And then Milton Stewart's podcast, Do It for the Gram. Yes. I've benefited from that immensely. And then um, Enneagram for the Culture also is an amazing podcast to start with. They give like a very, ele- like not even elementary, but just like a beginner's guide. And then you get to hear about their experiences as their types as black people when you get to hear other types talk it's just a great great podcast so those three things I think would be a good starting place and then if you choose to like complete continue and you want to learn more I definitely think it's like great to get connected to other people who are also doing a new game work um and talking to them about what you're discovering from your type I think that would be a great next step once you like have a good beginner's level understanding because I think a lot of times we do a new game work in isolation um yes and it doesn't work that way. He <laughs> wasn't creating, created for that purpose. <laughs> the five, yes. <laughs> um, I think, I think if you if you have friends in your life who are also on that self development, self actual self actualization journey, self discovery journey, and you have those people in your life, definitely pull them in, tell them about the Instagram, um, and make it a community thing. Um, I think, I, I mean, I'm, I'm talking from experience as well. I think lately, my my Instagram journey has become kind of isolated because of how busy I've become, um, which is why I really appreciate the narrative tradition, um, the yeah. narrative tradition in Uganda for having this um, people of, um, I think it's the BIPOC, I'm not sure if everyone's included, but the BIPOC like cohort, because every month I get to like reconnect with people who also care about this work. And so I would say those three, those one book and two podcasts, and then find some friends in the, in the space and talk to them. <laughs> Absolutely. You cannot do this effectively by yourself. I've grown so much in the last, when I started actually going out um, in Enneagram Charlotte, I live in the Charlotte area with Ann Gary and meeting people. And then I just went from there, but before I was just reading books and, you know, but it doesn't work if it doesn't work in real life, it's not, you know, effective. So, so what is the greatest compliment you have received as a part of your work or as a result of your work, I should say. Great question. What is the greatest compliment? I mean, this is a basic one that I'm sure a lot of people get, but like people have come up to me, especially after the IEA conference, just saying like, oh, I feel so seen and understood from the presentation that I did. Um, and I struggle with feeling seen and understood by the world. So to know that I, something that I did, something I'm doing is making someone else feel that way. That was just the best feeling ever. Um, but yeah, I think that might be the, the greatest. Of just, just like, oh, like I'm a, I'm doing something. This is not just for play play. Like I'm not just joking around. Like there's, there's yeah. substance to this that I, I'm not, that there's substance, substance to this that I shouldn't miss. Um, yeah. But yeah, yeah. I, I I know you're taking a break. I want to direct yeah. people to learn more about you, uh, but I know you're taking a break. But how, if they're interested in your work, uh, how can we learn more about you? Uh, obviously, the Instagram page is still up, um, and I do plan on returning. So follow it for now, and more content will be coming post graduation. But I also have my website up and running. It's theblackenneagram.com, I believe. I think so. I'll double check yeah. that. It's, it, it is. I, <laughs> it is. I can okay. verify that. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those and I'll put that in this. Awesome. And I'll put that in the description as well. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Um, those two things. And then I also have, and I don't talk about this often because it's not like it's not my baby, it's not my love child. But I wrote a book um called oh. Enneagram, Everyday Enneagram. It's not uh it's not fully people of color centered because it was like kind of a I was asked to write it, so it was very different. But I loved writing it. It was very fun. It's very it's a beginner's guide. Enneagram book. Um, I'm not sure when it's coming out. I think 2024. So when that comes out, it'll be on, it'll be on my website for you know everyone to see and you know purchase. It's also I think that would also be like a good something I'll tell the 22 year old man read my book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my book. I put a lot of energy and work. Like I was writing it while I was like interning during the summer, and that was just a hectic time. But yeah, those are my my plugs. That's awesome. Please let me know. Yes, for sure. And of course. You know, I would love to bring you on. We could talk yeah. about it. Yeah. Your energy is contagious, and um, I appreciate <laughs> you. Yeah. 
Thank so, you so much for having me. This was so much fun. <laughs> thank you. This is Total Confidence Podcast. So thankful for our special guest. I'm not going to try to say your name at this point. Okay. <laughs> My brain is fried with information. Dio. <laughs> so we thank y'all for listening and we will be back. <laughs>